So uh, I've been doing stop motion since about 2003, so that's going on nine years now. My medium of choice is Lego, but I'm going to be talking about stop motion in all of its various forms today. What is uh, stop motion animation? So uh, stop motion is really photography uh, in motion. Uh, I use that definition to differentiate it from other types of animation as well as uh, regular video production. So uh, the basic concept of stop motion <coughs> is that you put something in front of a camera, you take a picture, you move it a tiny amount, you take another picture, repeat a few thousand times, and then you have a movie. Uh, so you can see up here these two little Lego rock monsters uh, slightly moving each frame to frame, and then the amount that you move them, coupled with the speed that you play it back at, uh, determines the smoothness of the animation. So this one was filmed at 15 frames per second, or is playing back at 15 frames per second, which is the frame rate that I've sort of decided on. You know, normal, like traditional film is 24, video these days is either 30 or 60 frames per second. Um, 15 is a nice balance between uh, smoothness and not having to take a million pictures. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's uh, stop motion. Um, so the core elements of a stop motion animation are a physical camera taking still images as opposed to a virtual camera in a computer setting like you would with 3D animation. Um, a physically manipulated object as opposed to an object that's just doing its own thing. Um, that's how you differentiate it from time-lapse photography, uh, which is where you just set a camera up and take a bunch of pictures and play it back. Uh, so yeah, it's not to be confused with other forms of animation like Disney or Pixar, which are either drawn or computer animated. Uh, puppetry, where you have uh, something that's physically manipulated but it's in front of a video camera as opposed to a still camera. And then time-lapse photography. So anything you can do with traditional photography, tricks like long exposure, you can also do with stop motion because it's essentially it's just photographs and then set in motion. So uh, I, divide, I divide stop motion animation into three major categories. Um, puppetry, uh, replacement, and drawing. And of course, I just said that it's not puppetry, but it is <coughs> as well. Um, so the major form of stop motion animation that you'd see in uh, TV shows, commercials, or you know, major motion pictures is going to be wireframe animation. That's where they build uh, puppets uh, from scratch uh, over a wireframe base, um, usually with like a felt covering, so that you can have sort of any character you want. This is a ABC cartoon show from Saturday mornings of my childhood called Bump in the Night, and this crazy green guy, and also uses some claymation. Um, that one that you can't see is uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, which of course is one of the most famous stop motions, Coraline by the same people. Um, you know, sort of standouts. Um, and then this one down here is one that Chipotle just put out a few months ago, um, <clears throat> which I just thought was cool. So, um, people, when they think of stop motion, either think of wireframe, because that's um, sort of got the biggest impact, or they think of uh, claymation, is usually the one after that. So the idea behind it is that it's a posable figure so that you, you want something that will hold its position in between each frame. So clay is another way to do it. I don't know if anyone remembers California Raisin commercials, early 90s. Um, and uh, so those are definitely two of the most well-known types of stop motion. Um, another type of puppetry animation is where you use cutout animation. So this is typically done with um, on a flat glass surface with a camera pointing down and then you put like magazine cutouts and move them around. On the left we have Monty Python's Flying Circus animations by Terry Gilliam. Um, this is this utterly insane animator called Martha Colburn whose work is just insane uh, <laughs> as you can tell by the rapid camera Trickiness, but it's it's pretty uh, awesome too. Uh, so those were two, I thought, good examples of what you can do with uh, cutout animation. So another type of puppet that you can use with stop motion is actual physical human beings. 
Um, so uh, what this allows you to do is make people move in ways they could never move in live action because you can have them glide on one foot, a la Gumby, or uh, seem to fly through the air um, and have things moved across. So uh, this OK Co video also uses just sort of uh, random speed changes, but it does do a lot of stop motion stuff as well. Um, and this is called Tony versus Paul, which is uh, and viral video from YouTube where they uh, fight each other using stop motion. Pretty awesome. And then the last type of puppetry I'll talk about is just any other type of puppet. So uh, this one up top is uh, an official Lego video um, done by this guy, uh, David Pagano, who does really cool brick-built characters that have articulated joints. So they're very much like a wireframe <coughs> puppet, except it's made of Lego. Uh, this one down here, which is hard to see, is uh, filmed in a bookstore, and it's about books coming to life at night. So you know anything that you can um, pose and move around can sort of become a puppet for stop motion animation. Uh, another technique that's big is replacement. That's where you take similar objects and um, replace them one after another. So uh, in this video down at the bottom, which is the world's smallest, uh, stop motion animation because it's done on a microscopic level, so that's actually a penny rotating down there. The little girl who's skipping along, is um, you'll notice that she has about like two different movements when she's running, so they basically just have a character that's posed like this and a character that's posed like that, and they just um, sub them in every frame that they, she needs to go like that. So they did that with like I think 50, 50 different versions of her. So she can't, you can't pose her, but she comes pre-posed. Um, <laughs> I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, Michael Gondry uh, Lego video for the White Stripes. Um, he uses a lot of replacement techniques using Lego in there. Um, again, it's just um, replacing one bit with another. Uh, Pez is a really great animator who uses um, toys and food and household objects. Um, as this goes through, you'll see where he cuts up a Rubik's Cube and he uses like smaller versions of Rubik's Cubes to look like it when it's cut up. So it's all about, um, you know, the trick of uh, moving it from one to the other. So that's replacement animation. Um, and then the last type that I'm going to talk about is sort of drawing or painting. Um, so this is where you're usually doing something on a big 2D surface um, and then just sort of documenting the process. So this is done. This is the world's largest stop motion animation. These were both done by Ardman Studios, the guys who did um, Wallace and Gromit. Um, so this one's done on a beach, and this is like an actual rowboat and an actual person. And then they're just like drawing the whole thing in the sand. This one's done with jelly beans behind an actual person. Um, Post-it notes, and then that one's like graffiti across the city. Um, so, you know, I think stop motion in involves a lot of different forms. Um, and then the other type of drawing stop motion animation that's really popular is light animation where you um, use the long exposure techniques of photography so that you draw stuff with light and then take that picture and then do that again and again. Um, so this one is done with like light pens and this one is actually done with um, iPads where they use some software program so that as they drag the iPad through space it leaves like a light trail. And so they're just doing that over and over again for every single frame of this animation. And if you look closely, you can sort of see the, the animator's um, feet and legs around and the sort of trace of the iPad around them. Um, and I know these videos aren't all easy to see here, but um, I put a link at the end to a Pinterest page where I put um, all of these in one place so you can check them out. Um, so. That's sort of the range of what is possible with uh, stop motion animation. Um, but as far as actually making a stop motion animation, um, the first thing you need is a camera, which is pretty obvious, but um, you can use any sort of camera, really. Uh, I've done them on uh, my iPhone. Um, I'm using basically a DSLR there. I've got a webcam. I've done them on film cameras. I've done them on video cameras. As long as it can take a still image, you can make a stop motion animation with it. Um, and what camera you choose really depends on 
what you've got and what you're trying to do. Obviously, for those light animations, you need a camera where you can set the exposure to be that long so that you'll be able to capture it. Obviously, the more control you have over camera settings, the more you're going to be able to control what your animation looks like. Um, there's a few different um, stop motion apps that you can get for iPhone and iPads and whatnot. Excuse me. Um, uh, webcams are nice because they can hook in directly to a computer by default, uh, which means they're easy to control using stop motion software, uh, which is not going to be true of a point and shoot camera. And DSLRs are obvious, that's what a professional animator would use um, because you have the most control, you can swap in different lenses, um, and uh, then you just need to know how to connect it to your software if you're going to go that route. Um, and I'll get to software in a bit. Um, lighting, um, my sets, since I'm working in a Lego scale, are always really small, so I'm primarily using just desk lamps, which I forgot to bring, uh, covered with paper. Um, and uh, when I was at Firescape, I did a few where I had like the Ari kit just at a distance and you know was doing colored gels and stuff like that. But um, it doesn't take a lot of uh, money to get the, the right lighting for a stop motion animation. And then obviously if you're doing something like light animation, it's a completely different ballgame. But for a small set on a table, that's usually sufficient. Um, some miscellaneous tools. Um, masking tape is really important if you're doing something uh, set on a table so that you can tape everything down so that if you bump it with your hand, which you will never to do, it doesn't move everywhere and completely mess up your shot. Um, so masking tape I always keep on hand. Um, this uh, like sticky tack uh, or putty that you use to stick things to the wall is really good for when you have things that you need to just hold in place for a little bit. I found it really useful with uh, my Lego animations. Um, toothpick and uh, paper clip for getting in to manipulate uh, little people's hands, uh, things like that, because our hands are big and clumsy. So depending on what sort of puppet you're working with, uh, you'll probably want to create some sort of tool. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the actual process of s starting from the beginning, how you would make an animation like that's set to sound and all that. Um, but I just use like this $20 microphone I got at Office Max years and years ago for all my voice recording and it works great. Um, and then of course patience is very important because stop motion takes a lot of time. Um, so software. Um, when I started out I was not using any sort of animation software. I would just take pictures um, and then sort of keep track in my mind of where people were and then go from there and then look at the end result and if it was really bad I might retake it or I'd just go with it and let it be. What animation software allows you to do is connect uh, a camera to your computer and control all of the camera functions through the computer and then when you take a picture it already puts it into sequence um, for your video and then when you take you're going to take another your next picture you can overlay the previous picture, sort of half transparency, so you can see exactly where it was. And I'll show you that on my computer in a few minutes. Um, exactly where it was so that you know exactly how much you want to move it. And that you can set it to play back the last few frames over and over again so you can figure out exactly how much you want to move it for the uh, next frame. Um, and, uh, you know, for if you're super, super professional, like, the studio that made Coraline is called uh, Laika, L-A-I-K-A. -A. They're based in Portland, Oregon. So they use software to control rigs that move their cameras so that they have camera movements that are synced with every frame. Uh, I'm not doing camera movements of that level, but um, software can help you sort of keep track of all the different components because one of the big things about stop motion animation is that it takes a lot of pre-planning to pull off it the sort of cinematic type of stop motion animation that you'd see in Coraline or Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, again, depending on, to start out, you know, you can just do it on your cell phone and have fun. But uh, that software is definitely becomes a necessity as you get up in the upper ranges. So sort of the process for making a uh, animation that's set to sound is that first you want to write your script, then you want to record all the voices, 
then you want to basically edit that all together in Final Cut, maybe do storyboards, um, because you never want to spend more time animating than you absolutely have to. So you basically decide where all your shot breaks are going to be, and then you uh, only animate camera angles exactly as many frames as they need to be. Um, and what software allows you to do is you can actually um, see, uh, type in what the dialogue is, and every frame it, you'll, you can uh, see what syllable you're supposed to be on in people's words. Uh, and if you're doing mouth animations for that, that's really important because you know have to know what mouth shape to put on them. Um, that's getting ahead of myself, though. So software is great. Oh, and now I'm going to do the live demo. So let me switch over to the software, and I'll show you that. So this program that I'm pulling up here is uh, Dragon Frame. Let's see if I can get another shot of it there. So uh, this is obviously my camera setup over here. I've got my um, Micro Four Thirds camera, which I don't know if you're familiar with. It's a standard that's similar to DSLR, but separate. The benefit of a Micro Four Thirds camera is that it doesn't have a physical shutter. Uh, that's important for stop motion animation because you're taking a lot of pictures, and most uh, camera shutters are rated for about 3,000 pictures, which is nothing to a stop motion animator. Four, micro Four Thirds don't have a physical shutter, so there's nothing, no physical elements to wear out by taking lots of pictures. It's all done digitally. Uh, I have a manual remote for the camera so that I don't actually have to touch the camera to take a picture because that ends in camera movement and bumps that are unwanted. Um, and just take a picture now. All right, there. So see how he's uh, has that ghosty overlay of himself? So that lets you see how much you've moved him from the previous frame. And then you can uh, instantly play back and loop what you've just done so you can watch it over and over again to figure out how much you want to move him. And uh, if you keep moving and adding in, it'll eventually look like he's doing something mostly just sort of spinning around now. But um, so that's what's great about uh, the software is that you know you can instantly see what you've done as opposed to if you're just taking pictures on a camera you have to wait till you're done and pull them into Final Cut and look at them all together. Um, you can see down the side here where I've got the um, audio all listed out by uh, the syllables. You know, what do you think you're doing? Why, hello, Terry. Um, so this scene is uh, 222 frames. Uh, I'm bad at math right now, but if you divide it by 15, that's how many seconds long this animation is. Um, and you can see how uh, it can easily add up to taking a long time to make these things. But um, so uh, yeah, that's the, the basics of stop motion. And this is my current setup. That's my older setup that I was using before that has a cheap webcam and uses free software. Uh, and I've listed all these software options on my website article. So now uh, I guess open the floor to questions and then people can play around. I've got a box of toys. How do you handle effects like moving water? Have you ever done that before? Uh, yes, I have. Should I play show and tell? You know, basically you have to look at uh, what regular water looks like and then try to recreate that with whatever medium you're using. So uh, when I did waves, I looked at like the wakes of boats, and then I just made like little Lego plates that I moved every frame to make water. Um, I haven't done, I tend to stay away from hard things like water. Um, it's only been a couple times that everyone's like, oh my god, those waves are the best part. It's like, I hated those waves. <laughs> um, but yeah. But I've seen um, some people who would like, who would use like blue sand to be water which I don't think looks that good, but, um, you know, water is definitely a, a tricky one, and uh, making, like, especially, like, an ocean, like, actual waves is, uh, people usually just tend to avoid it. I'm curious to see, um, you know, the, the movie Pirates that's coming out soon, it's by Ardman. I'm curious to see how they handle water there, but, um, yeah, mostly I avoid it. You know, I, I definitely get the most satisfaction out of the most complicated stuff that I do.
I have this character in my animated series called Robophilia, who's this like robot reporter. She's sort of like a mix between Mega Man and uh, a crazy person. Um, and she's always like, she, well, she's sort of Inspector Gadget in that she has just like random arm movements. And I should actually pull this up rather than describing it poorly. Uh, so she's always a lot of fun to animate. Um, the thing that I'm always having to come up against it in making this series is that um, I want to do crazy big animation things, but that takes much longer, and I have a devoted base of like 12-year-old boys who's always <laughs> clamoring for the next episode. So I have to intercut it with a lot of talking headshots so that I can have something that's easy to animate. Like this scene right here, where it's just a guy at a desk. Um, that's actually the benefit of the news show, is that news shows has a lot of people at desks and you don't question it. Um, and then you can cut away to something that's completely insane and totally over the top, um, like this. Um, so yeah, so that uh, took that took three months from when I started to when it was finished. Uh, I had a lot of people helping me out with that one because, as you can tell, there are over characters on screen that are always in motion. So I actually had I would assign a person to each um, character um, and would have just people over for the weekend and animate for like five hours and then by the end it was like a hundred man hours of time but it wasn't all me for once so uh for a two minute video so there's definitely a lot of time and that's just animating time uh the sets that i built were also relatively large and elaborate because those are on a bigger scale than the minifigures so that was um being built over the months and actually because of the length of time that this was being produced, I would actually, I didn't, hadn't built all the stuff that was at the end when I, we started animating, um, even though it's all one continuous shot, but, um, you know, I was just moving things in and out. So, um, the nice thing about doing this completely for my own sort of enjoyment is that I don't have anyone really making me produce things quickly so that I can just do the craziest thing I can imagine. Um, and you know, Lego is a great medium because you can build anything and it's relatively cheap and it's small, so I don't need a giant sound stage to do something like that. Um, I did it all on a desk, probably about the size. Um, uh, last year I did a Kickstarter project um, to raise money um, for completing... Uh, so this animation is one part of a seven-part uh, video that when it's complete will be about like a 20-30 minute video um, which I'll put out in DVD. So I did a Kickstarter project for that DVD and so that has added to the guilt level of how long it takes me to complete things because now I have people who paid me to do it uh, and that's how I got this new camera because uh, I wouldn't have been able to afford that on my own. But um, So that that has definitely been a change and uh, has given me lots of guilt but hasn't made things get done any faster. So uh, that was a long explanation to that question. Other questions? How big is your Lego collection? Um, it's, it's really big. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have an exact number, but I have a whole room in my house dedicated to my Lego collection. So, uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces. Of that basis. Probably not a million. Yeah. What made you decide that you wanted to do this? Um, I never really had a choice. Um, you know, I was a cartoon addict as a kid, so like Cartoon Network, I would just, you know, mainline every day, even if it was the terrible old Hanna-Barbera stuff, like, I didn't care as long as it was bright and colorful, um, you know, I enjoyed it. So, um, you know, and then as I said, like the very first thing I put in front of a camera was Legos, because even as a kid I had, there was a lot in the house. Um, so it, it's just sort of, you know, for me it was any school project I could possibly think of, I would do a video for. Um, you know, it's just the way that I could best ex express the crazy stuff in my head. Um, so, you know, it, it just sort of felt more natural than anything else I've ever done. So that's how I got to it. Other thoughts? Questions? People want to try animation?